finally good to be back and not have to contend with snow and ice and all the crud that we have had the last few months. And we're going to pick back up this morning with part three of understanding the kingdom. And to be truthful, I still don't know how long this thing's going to be. We'll just teach it until we're done. But I really want to take my time. One of the things that we tend to forget, and I, th I think every minister ought to be not only trained in hermeneutical principle, but also have to read through several systematic theologies, not only to understand the systematic theology as presented from their particular group, but to understand several things about it, that there's, there's two types of revelation in the earth. There is the natural revelation the Apostle Paul talks about that we can look and we can see the, the splendors of the universe. And it causes us to recognize there's a God. That regardless of what the atheists say and the evolutionists say, uh, this thing could have not happened by chance. The, it, it is the mathematics to figure that out is astronomical. Even evolutionists have finally, uh, have finally come to the conclusion or finally had to be honest that there has not been enough time that existed in the universe for man to evolve. And so now they're going the next step. They're saying, well, panspermia, that uh, aliens stopped by and they tweaked our DNA and they're able to take us to what we needed to be. But then you have circular logic again, because if the universe isn't old enough for us to evolve, how did they evolve? It's circular logic. There has to be a God. And so the second thing that we had to have to make sense of all this is called special revelation, that God gave us his word. And special revelation is progressive revelation. God can't dump all the information of who he is and what's going on in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. It has to play out from Genesis to Revelation. And each time he, the Bible says God does it precept upon precept, line upon line, he's got to add it. But when he does, just like he, if you're reading a novel, wouldn't it be confusing if halfway through the novel, all the players change roles and change names. And all, and all of a sudden, without warning, all the definitions of what was introduced change on you. It would be impossible to understand the last half of a novel. And our problem is because we have been so successfully disenfranchised from our Hebraic heritage, we only read the last one-third of the book when all the definitions are in the first two-thirds. As God goes through, as he moves from Genesis on through, he begins introducing concepts slowly. And then he builds, and there is, a, uh, there is a continuity of the word of God that once God introduces something, it remains the same throughout. The definitions don't change, aren't you glad? Because it'd be like hitting a moving target that they're constantly changing the definitions to. And so what is so important about this? We have discovered that God's commandments, the, the way that God brought order out of the chaos that the fall of Lucifer created was he began to issue commands to planet Earth. He began to issue commands to our solar system. He began issuing commands to the universe. And the universe responded. Then God creates man we discovered that, that the blessing that God gave to man was not putting him in a garden, was not the absolute wealth of provision that surrounded him. The blessing that God gave is God spoke words of dominion. They were commands of dominion when you read them in the Hebrew. You take dominion. You remultiply. Or you multiply. You replenish the earth. They were direct commands of God. And those commands of God enabled Adam and Eve to begin walking in the kingdom because the kingdom and the commandments of God are inseparable. And we're going to see this here just in a little bit. So we have a lot of Christians today talking about the kingdom, but they're doing it without commandments. It's impossible. That's why things are so screwy. And so with that in mind, I want to pick up here in Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. And Adam had commandments more than just be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and to take dominion. That he was given commandments to do several things in the garden. Now I want you to look at this starting in verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So there were commandments there to dress and keep. 
So he had, he, there was, there's both explicit and implicit commandments here. He set him in that garden for a reason. You keep it and you dress it, and then he gives him the big commandment. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden that thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's a commandment. And somehow or another, we, we have been divorced. We think commandments came after the fall. We think commandments came with Moses. But yet the Bible defines sin in the book of 1 John as the violation of God's commandments, the violation of God's laws. If Adam did not have commandments in the garden, he could not have sinned. But it was the very nature of those commandments. Those commandments allowed him to operate in that garden and to move in the kingdom of God. And what God was basically saying, there's one tree in the garden. The day that you eat thereof, you're going to die to the kingdom. You're going to die to what I brought and gave you. You're going to be, because biblically, theologically, death is separation. The moment that you eat of it, you're going to be separated from me. You're going to be separated from the kingdom. And then when you understand it later on, he said, in that day you eat of it, you shall die. Adam didn't live to be a thousand because the day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. Now, we can get into quantum physics and how that as you approach the speed of light, a day would be a thousand years if you're on the other side of the speed of light. It's all connected. Physics actually proves the Word of God. We just have a bunch of heathenistic scientists that reject this book that are looking at the right data, but they're coming to other conclusions because their paradigms are contrary to this. Many of them are flowing in Gnosticism where they're saying, you know, if we could really flow at this at the quantum level, we could become gods. Oh, I've, yeah, we're, we're going to find out about that a little bit. That's the promise of the serpent in the garden. You become as gods. No. Your paradigm is wrong. When we look at it, we understand the splendor and the majesty of God. The power of God that was exerted to keep this universe together, you begin to take things at the, at the subatomic level and the quantum level. There, there is the smallest unit that is measurable is called a Planck unit. Because there, there was a physicist named Planck that did this. So there's Planck units, there's Planck units of energy. There's, and what's interesting is once you, and you, you can always divide something, right? You cut it in half, it's half as long. You cut it in half, it's half as long. You can do that at the quantum level until you get to the Planck. Now when you get to a Planck, you cut it in half it ceases to be somewhere and it becomes everywhere. It loses its locality. And so at the subatomic level, how much energy is holding our universe together that's holding you together right now? If you, if you, so you're dealing at the, at the quantum level, at the quark level, super, super, super small. But if you had two units of Planck energy and you got them too close together, they'd create a black hole simply from the energy and the gravity of it. That's how much power. That's why the Bible says everything is upheld by the word of his power. We have yet to understand how much power flowed from God the moment that he created. Unbelievable. And to think that that power could exist outside of a God who brought it into existence who is all powerful is a pipe dream. Now that I've got your head spinning, let's look at the word here that is used in the Hebrew for he was set there to dress it and to keep it. Dress in, in the Hebrew is abad, which means to work for another, to serve by labor. And it was also used whenever the Levitical priesthood was doing service to God. He was there to serve God. He was there to do things in the garden. He wasn't, he wasn't wandering in the garden with nothing to do. He had duties that he was required to perform in the garden. What they were, the Bible doesn't address. Maybe he would rearrange things. Maybe he decided he wanted apples over here and pears over here. We know that he could, in a sense, till the garden without having to break a sweat. Because part of the curse, which we'll get into in our next session, was that he would do it by the sweat of his brows, and now that the earth itself would resist him with thorns and thistles and weeds, and anybody that's ever gardened knows all about that. It seems to fight you. But then it goes on to say, not only was he set there to work for God, 
But shamar means to keep it. Now this word keep means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, to be a watchman. Adam was set as a watchman over the garden to keep something out. Now, to me that means that he would have to have been given description of what it was he was supposed to keep out. That very possibly God told him there's, there's something going to come in the garden that's going to tell you to eat of the tree over here that I told you not to eat of. Your job is to keep him out and to keep him from talking. Now, isn't that like a lot of our lives? How many of us have had the devil try to talk to us and to do things and to bring strife into our household or to bring things in our life? Post-Calvary, it is still our job. We go back. Our home is like a spiritual garden that as we obey the commandments of God and that we're walking with Jesus, it brings the blessing of God. And there will always be a tree in your garden that there will be something come up that tree that will try to speak to take away the blessings of God in your life. And your job in Christ is to keep your garden, to be a watchman over that garden, to be a watchman over a nation, to be a watchman over a city. Now, we need to understand just how, part, how important that is. We, we see in the beginning when, when the earth became void, that it was the influence of Lucifer. We see God recreate it, and he speaks commandments into it. He brings his kingdom. He brings heaven on earth. He brings all this, and now he says, now I want you to keep it out. Now Adam opens the door, we'll find, and lets him in. And the only time in our, in our future, while there is still a planet earth, that there is heaven on earth is the millennial reign in which Lucifer is bound. When he is bound, his influence is bound. That the lamb is going to be able to lay down by the line. That this earth is going to know peace. It's going to know that sabbatical rest that can only come with when Jesus is here. Even so much so it says that even a child can play by an adder's hole and that snake won't bite and kill him. I mean, it's, it's an awesome time. That's when we're going to be able to beat all of our, our, our swords into plowshares. That there, w there will be no uh, industri military industrial complex will cease to exist when Jesus comes and rules and reigns. You take away the influence of the one that Adam let in, and it all disappears for a thousand years, just to prove a point. Only Messiah bringing the kingdom with him and imposing and imprisoning the bringer of destruction or Lucifer can paradise be restored to this planet. Now, if we learn to keep the influence of Lucifer out of our homes, chaos can't function. Now, before I move into the next section, I want to, there's a couple of things I want to note here. To walk in authority and to enjoy the abundance which was in the earth before the fall of man requires the commandments of God. You had to have them. After the fall, the promises and commandments were uh, given to man to provide provision, protection, and authority. The finished work of Christ did not free us from the commandments of God. They're the very, they're the very mechanism that God has decreed will bring his kingdom. Rather, he freed us from the restraints of sin that kept us from walking them out properly. Adam was walking in them properly. The snake was kept out of the garden. It was a paradise. When he let him in and let his influence in and began to break commandments, it let the devil in. And since he was the first in the earth, and God had given him the authority. Lucifer has a right to do what he's doing until that lease, that there, there in the Hebrew, when God says, I give you authority, there, there is an element within the Hebrew that represents, it was, it, was, it was like a lease, that there's a beginning to it and there's an end to it. And when there's an end to it, 
that's when Lucifer loses his right to do things. And I even think in the book of Revelation, where we see that Jesus is, is taking the seals off the scroll, we're never really told what that scroll is or what the seals really are. I think those seven seals are the authority that Adam was given in the earth, and that was the lease. And Jesus begins to systematically as it comes to a close. And see, the seven seals, when you look at how they did things at, at, that, at that day and time, it wasn't seven seals on the outside of the scroll. They, they would have certain part of the scroll, and then to a certain point, then they would seal it. They would roll it some more. They would seal it and roll it some more. So there are seven aspects to Adam's dominion that Lucifer took when man fell that Jesus is systematically undoing. And as he does, we see the, the, the things that happen with the seals are the wrath of Lucifer because he knows his time is short. So let's take it a little bit further. I want to get into the serpent in the garden. In Genesis 3 and 1, we read this. Now the serpent was more subtle the subtile than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. I wish that every seminary in America would spend about six months on this verse with every preacher. Because if you really take it apart, a lot of the stuff that is being espoused by Christian TV today wouldn't fly anymore. So let's go ahead and take it apart. This, this word for serpent is nahesh in Hebrew, and it means serpent, snake, uh, or a fling serpent mythologically. But I want to read some of the research of Mark Flynn in his book, The Forbidden Secrets of Lambeth. I want you to understand some things this morning. He says that God, uh, God would not have made Adam and Eve incapable of appreciating the creation or his presence. He did not create paradise and somehow limits its inhabits its ability to experience joy, peace, love, vitality, the appreciation of beauty, and the harmony with him. The tree did not simply offer the knowledge of evil, but evil along with good. In other words, the fruit did not cause the earth to become a place of absolute evil or outer darkness, but a place likened to one where the subtility of evil would be allowed to infect it. Creeps in and infects. I thought that was brilliant. According to the account in Genesis, a creature that obviously had been created before man entered the realm of heaven on earth in order to convince Eve to try the fruit of the tree. In Hebrew, the creature is nefesh. It is part in, or, 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 or nahesh, and it is important to understand that nahesh was, a, was the creature's name before it appeared to Eve in the garden. So although it's translated serpent, it's actually more like what we call today a proper noun. This was its name. The root of Nahesh is the Hebrew word to practice divination, to observe signs and omens, and to learn by experience. The Hebrew lexicon of the Old Testament originally by the theologian and master Greek or Hebrew uh, language, uh, Gesenius, uh, his work is known as Gesenius' lexicon, adds the meaning of Nahesh as hissing or whisperer. The whisper camp, come here, I'll show you. Come here, I'll show you stuff God doesn't want you to know. Come here, I'm going to give you the secrets. Come here. It's exactly what this, what this creature did in the garden. The creature possessed extraordinary abilities for planning and, uh, and observation. It understood the intellectual and emotional nature of the dust creatures that God had created and knew exactly how to persuade and manipulate them. The Nahesh was, was unique in all of God's creation since it was the first to pursue the, uh, an, uh, the act contrary to the will of its creator. The creator of the universe later, the term Nahesh, would also uh, come to equal a serpent after it took the form of the curse and God gave it as a punishment as an act in the garden. The term subtle or subtile is used to describe the creature's essential attributes. Now, the term for uh, subtile is aron in Hebrew with the root aram. In addition to subtile, it means to be crafty, but it also can mean to uncover and to be spiteful, is what's describing the serpent. Now, uh, Flynn goes on to equate that this, that this nahesh is, is found in mythology. They call it a phoenix. 
It was a winged serpent or a seraphim that was this fla- that was this blazing flaming serpent. It approached. We always know you always see the the snake in the garden in in, in in pictures where it's just like a snake hanging from a branch. This thing set the tree on fire with brilliance. It looked like a blazing phoenix or a winged serpent in that tree. And so and we, we need to understand why this is so important. The Bible says that God is a fire from the waist up and a, and a fire from the waist down. Adam and Eve, I believe, since they were creating the image of God, originally was clothed in the glory of God. The moment they sinned, the glory was departed, their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Here you have another creature showing itself as brilliant flaming of fire, just like how Almighty God, Yahweh Elohim, would come and visit them in the garden and begin promising them other things. This is the light that every Freemason seeks after. This is the light that the Illuminati seek after. It is the Nehesh that they're following after, the promises of what he gave in the garden that they could become as gods. Now, what we need to take apart, well, and some of you know, is this, here's the question we have to ask, and I still haven't come to a complete conclusion. Was this Lucifer? And some people say, well, you know, he's a cherub and not a seraphim. Dr. Michael Heiser, in examining these, these scriptures, brought out something I thought very interesting, that, because I was taught in systematic theology when you go through angelology, that, that seraphim and cherubim are two separate classes of angel. But what he discovered in reading the original text, when you get to the prophets, they begin to use those two words interchangeably. So very possibly, it's two different manifestations of the same type of angel. Although we do know that part of God's divine counsel fell with Lucifer, and that many classes of angels that that God had given levels of authority, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, the Bible says God created the principalities and powers. They were originally good ones, but part of them fell with him, but they maintained their authority and their dominion. So we have a lot of different classes of angels. So whether this was Lucifer himself, or this was a specific one that had teamed up with Lucifer for this specific injection, he he follows the same thing. The Bible says Lucifer can appear as an angel of light. We actually get the, the, the idea of that, of this blazing phoenix manifesting in a tree. And I think it's funny, you know, this, this may have been a huge tree. I can imagine like maybe like a huge oak tree or something, you know, this huge massive tree, and you have this angel, this flame. You can see the flames of fire for, for miles. And so God contrasts that by appearing to Moses in a burning bush. <laughs> he says, I don't need to show out to get my job done. In fact... This, this Nehesh started it by lifting himself up in a tree, and Jesus finished it by being lifted up in a tree. He said, you think all mankind's going to follow you? He said, but if I be lifted up, all men will be drawn to me. They're going to be drawn away from the tree of fire and be drawn to the Lamb of God in a tree. Oh, that just makes me happy. Now, I want you to notice something because we need to understand. Once you understand the modus operandi of the Nehesh, it will remain the same forever. We're, we're establishing first principle truths here. And the first thing he does is he questions and puts into question the commandments of God. Not only does he put the, the, the because uh, let's, let's read here. Let's pick up with verses 3 through 5. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the, of every, of the, of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You don't have to keep those commandments. Boy, didn't that sound familiar? There's now no, there, there will be no consequences for not keeping the commandments of God. For God knoweth in the day that ye eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. 
You see, God, by his commandments, are keeping you from the good stuff. That's what the serpent said. That's what the Nehesh said. He questioned the very motives of why God gave his commandments. Now, you were told by God to keep me out. But you know why he kept you out? He wanted to keep you from being a God. That's why he kept you out. And so I am here to complete the creation process and allow you to ascend into Godhood. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? And the mechanism to do it is you have got to reject the commandments of God because God was a bad God for doing that. Oh, my word. Let that sink in just for a minute. God doesn't change. That's, that's one of the attributes of God. God's perfect, and if God would change one iota, that means that he had, at some time or another, he had a state in which he was imperfect. So when God gives a commandment, whether it's not to eat of the tree, or not to do this, not to do that, if he would change, it causes him to cease to be God. In fact, in the very last book of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, he makes this promise, and it's for our benefit. He said, I am the Lord God, and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Because he doesn't change, we're still here. But yet we're preaching from pulpits that God changed. The first tree brought into question the commandments of God and God's motive behind them. Now they're telling us the cross did away with the commandments. Do you see a pattern here? Messing with the tree instead of the Lamb of God. Oh. It's the tactic of the Nehesh to bring God's commandments and his intervention from and his intention for them into question. Once he embedded the concept that the commandments of God were bad and that God was keeping something from mankind through the commandments, he could then place the seed to get Adam and Eve to violate the only thing placed in the garden to keep his influence at bay. Dang. <laughs> now, them responding to the Nehesh and violating the God's commandments brought the sin nature into the hearts of men. And the sin nature is an inclination to violate every commandment in the book. If sin is defined in Old and New Testament, and you cannot find one single place where it, it deviates one degree that sin is the violation of God's commandments. And the very nature of sin is to violate them all. How can the cross of Christ now nullify the commandments of God? That was already done in another tree. Let me propose this to you. Jesus did not die to save you from hell. Hell is a consequence from something else. Jesus came to save you from sin to save you from sin nature, to save you from the nature that was embedded in the heart of man by the Nehesh that would cause you to resist, violate, or question God's reasons for giving commandments. Now, I want to, and, and <laughs> guys, this, 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 listen to this, because the Nehesh basically said, and, he, and, he, he, and, and it's, it's part of that nature that the commandments of God are bad. Questioning the very intention of God. 
Jesus was supposed to deliver me from that. And how can he do that while setting me free from them? He's supposed to be setting me free from the, from the, from the instinctual desire to reject them. I want you to listen to what A.W. Pink said. The nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misinterpreted by the present-day evangelist. He announces a Savior from hell rather than a Savior from sin. And this is why so many are fatally deceived, for there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and the worldliness. Welcome to the modern church. The great falling away has already happened. When you stopped preaching, being redeemed from sin, being redeemed from the inclination to violate God's commandments, the moment that you stopped preaching that, people stopped getting saved. That's why Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. (laughs) No, no, just sink it in. They're eating from a tree with other fruit. (laughs) A tree of obedience. Everybody jump. (laughs) The old Baptist is starting to roll rise up in me this morning. A tree that when I eat of that fruit, when I when I receive of Christ the tree of life. I no longer question God's intentions. I have a heart desire to be obedient to my Father. If God said don't do it, I don't care how pleasurable it is, I'll never do it another day in my life. I would rather die than do it. But yet what happens? Christian theology today continually questions. Well, God doesn't mean that. Well, God doesn't mean this. Well, God doesn't mean this. You need to lay one on you? When God said marriage was only between a man and a woman has the same weight as thou shall not eat pork. Christian, you have no right to question one and then demand that others follow the other. You're either all in or all out, Jack. You see, one of the reasons that we're losing this argument with the new sexual revolution that is basically paganism is they're looking at our hypocrisy. You can't pick out marriage and pick out tithing and reject the rest. All we do is pick out the ones that might affect us. Don't kill, don't steal, don't don't you lie about me. But you know, thanks to the cross, I can just serve God any way that I want to. No, you can't. He is very particular. Because the doctrine and the instruments of which the Nahesh brought into the earth are absolutely opposite of the kingdom. They are to neutralize the kingdom and to separate you from God's best and to separate you from heaven and to separate you. And all that will do is bring you into chaos. Let me tell you something. If you see a believer that all they do is move from one chaotic thing to another, they're not disconnected from the Nahesh yet. They're still eating of the wrong tree. Come on now. We need to understand this truth. Carnality and worldliness are opposed to God's commandments, which not only point out their reality, but once man is truly saved, the commandments of God give him the authority to keep them at bay in his life. Because we need to realize it was something man did. He purposely of a clear understanding, violated God's commandments, and it opened the door to the kingdom of darkness to seize this planet. Once we come to Jesus, our paganistic ways, our sin in our life, we're we're now in a room with a thousand doors open or more that the devil can come in and out, in and out, in and out. And God is saying, now learn my word and quit doing what the Nehesh taught you to do 
and start doing what I taught you to do and start living by my standards. And as you do, you systematically begin closing all the doors to the enemy and you begin systematically obedience to God opens the doors to him and shuts the doors to the devil. So really it comes down to this. Believer, who are you obeying? Are you obeying the snake in the garden? This brilliant phoenix that promised to give light, that said the commandments of God didn't matter and that God had an ulterior motive, that he was keeping you away from something when he gave them to you. Are you going to believe and eat from that tree or are you going to eat from a tree that sprang from Calvary? That Jesus was the absolute epitome of obedience. He said, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to do it. I don't say anything unless the Father tells me to say it. He lived all 613 commandments of God perfectly. And oh, by the way, if you're overwhelmed by that, there's over a thousand in the New Testament that either explain or further define the 613 in the Old. He lived them perfectly. If I'm drawing from him, him, I'm going to do things just like he did. I'm going to want to do the commandments of God. I'm going to want to keep the feast of the Lord. I'm going to reject a religious spirit, which right now is rampant in the Hebraic roots movement to the point of absolute sickening. I've had people say, no, you know, if you, if you can't speak Hebrew and everything isn't done in Hebrew, then I'm not even going to listen to you. I saw this week they got a Paleon, New Test Paleon Hebrew New Testament. Even if portions of the New Testament were written in Hebrew, it would not have been in Paleon Hebrew. You have to invent it. Paleon Hebrew had not been used by anybody since Babylon. And what many commentators, remember when there was the writing on the wall with Daniel and nobody could interpret it? He was the only one old enough to recognize Paleon Hebrew, most likely, because Hebrew became more like it is today. It became more sophisticated. And so that other generation had been raised up with a, with a new version of their, of their Hebrew. And Daniel looked and said, oh, that's Paleon Hebrew. This is what it says. You're measured. You're lacking. You're out of here. You know, that's, that's the Mike Lake version of that. <laughs> So how can we have a New Testament written in Paleon Hebrew when Paleon Hebrew had been for you know, over a thousand years, had not been in use? It's just like, you know, is Jesus' name Yehoshua or Yeshua? Well, if it had been pre-Babylon, it would have been Yehoshua, but by the time of, and after Babylon, between Babylon and the time of the New Testament, it had been shortened to Yeshua. And so we get in these big discussions. Well, that's where education kind of helps just a little bit, a little bit of etymology. And we get in these big arguments. In English, his name is Jesus. And you can take it etymologically through linguistics and take it from English to Latin to Greek to Hebrew, and it's unified. Yeshua brought forward into English is Jesus. And our people, we, uh, all the, this, the craziness, guys. The Bible says every kindred, every tongue will worship him and accept him. Therefore, they're going to have to know him in their own tongue. We find that Paul used a Greek. The Septuagint is probably most likely what he used to preach out of to these Greek-speaking people. There is no instruction that we will find anywhere in the New Testament that says, thou shalt learn Hebrew. God had set it up perfectly that he had, he, hundreds of years before Paul was ministering, several hundred years, God moved on some rabbis to translate the Hebrew Tanakh into Greek and call it the Septuagint so that Paul would have a platform to preach Jesus to a Gentile world. The awesomeness of God. So some of these things that are going around are, are you're, guys, you are clouding the issue. You're going to drive people away from the truth because you are moving by a religious spirit. If the Nahesh can't get you one way, he'll get you the other. 
and they end up in Talmud, and they end up in the Kabbalah, thanking they're following God. The purity of Moses and the purity of Jesus is where we need to stay. And I can take a King James Bible, my Strong's Concordance, a couple of good lexicons, Stayers for the new, Brown Drivers Biggs or Gassinius for the old, and back it up with the, the, uh, the complete Jewish Bible and the Amplified Bible, and I can dig so deep that I almost can't get myself out. It's that rich. And it's time that we begin undoing what this flaming phoenix had done in the garden by returning to the purity of the Word of God. And when God said it, quit explaining it away. If it smacks, if it tastes, if it sounds like what that serpent said in the garden, how about us not do it even after the cross? How can Jesus deliver us from, from a being that questioned the commandments of God and then Jesus, oh, well, by the way, since I went to the cross, the commandments don't matter. These are now the only commandments you're going to live by. Go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and don't forget to tithe. Yeah, make sure you marry a woman. Guys, no facial hair. I, and, and, well, the church I was raised in, I couldn't preach, even if I was still part of their denomination, until I shaved this off. My wife likes this. I like it. What you guys have never seen is Mike Lake without it. Mike Lake needs the facial hair. Okay? It used to be when I preach, I used to frighten people into hell with my bare face. But seriously, all these rules that we make, we tell people that we are redeemed from, from the law, and yet we replace it with our own. That's what the Nechesh did in the garden. Now, here's the kicker, guys, and I, I want you to think about this. Once the Nechesh was able to separate Adam and Eve from the commandments of God by getting them to violate it, he was able to separate them from the kingdom of God. They're now on the outside looking in. We're going to find out next in our next session that God comes and God says, I'm going to fix this. But you know what? It's going to take him 6,000 years to completely get it done. It took 4,000 years to bring about the cross. We're still waiting on Jesus to return and to, and to fix the mess that the Dekash has done in the earth today. There's a lesson to be learned from that. When sin is at the door and the enemy is tempting you to violate the word of God, what you let in may take you the rest of your life to get out even if you're walking with God. Better not to do it. That's why God can bless and he brings no sorrow with it. Anytime Lucifer, his kingdom, blesses you, it always brings a lot of sorrow and a lot of darkness with it. I'd rather have the blessing of the Lord. Well, Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Father, I, I thank you for the series. Father, I think it's foundational. Father, it's almost like building a systematic theology regarding the kingdom. And Father, I ask for my grace to keep grace in my life, that I could keep it right on center of what you're revealing and what's true in your word. And Father, I ask for an anointing of supernatural grace in the, in the ears of every hearer, that they could return to your ways in a balanced way like Jesus and not yield to a religious spirit or error that is on every side, Father God. But in a, in a, in a, in a time that error is moving in an unprecedented amount in every segment of society, Father, let your truth be established in the hearts of the remnant, I ask. In Jesus' name.